and I will be in charge of introducing the speakers of the, of the breaking stations of this room. Although we, we will have time for questions at the end, the presenters will let you know whether you will be able to address your questions at any time during the presentation. This presentation will be in English language. Simultaneous translation is available in channel one and two. Additional headphones and are available at the room or the registration area. We will really appreciate that you change your mobile phone to vibration or silent mode in order to have your full attention to this session. And hand it before you. Finally, please make sure you complete the evaluation form for this session and hand it before you leave this room. Your feedback and recommendations are very important to hits. Now, we are ready to start. The title of this presentation is Enhancing the Culture of Care and Redefining in Local Parent Parentis by Dr. Michael Hodmaker and Mrs. Deborah Hart from Borough of Manhattan Community College of the City University of New York. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, we have Deborah live from New York. It's Friday morning. Live from New York. Am I coming in? Yes, Deborah. Okay. So the um, presentation this good morning, everyone, and um, thank you for the opportunity to pre present to you today. Um, we're going to be covering four major areas in this presentation. Um, BMCC culture, BMCC, who we are. Um, the look at in local parentis and higher education. We're going to examine the needs of students, and we're going to discuss ways BMCC has developed culture of care to meet the needs of our students. So if we talk briefly about who we are as an institution, we're really the largest of the seven community colleges in the city University of New York. Our breakdown of about 25,000 students, um, as you can see on the screen, 27% of those students are new freshmen. Um, we have a little more females that attend our institution than males at 57 to 42. Um, small percentage of African American. Um, and as we go down, you'll see that um, our Hispanic population is a fairly large population in terms of there being 41.1% of, um, of our students who attend BMCC. Um, so the bulk of our students really are full-time students at 68%. Um, of course, 31% of our students are part-time, coming in the evening and the weekends, um, oftentimes. And um, most of our students, about 88% of them, receive uh, financial aid, whether Pell grant, uh, Pell tap, or um, or loans. We're we're a very very diverse population here at BMCC with 168 countries represented, and you can see some of the countries listed there. And I was very happy to see that my country is actually highlighted, Guyana. Um, and we speak um, about 103 languages among the students who attend our school. Dean? So the students of uh, Vermont Act Community College, most of them are, are New Yorkers, they live in New York. You can see the breakdown, that's the beautiful city of New York. And you can see most of our students do not come from Manhattan, where we're located. Most of them are coming from the outer boroughs, uh, specifically Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx. And a few of them take the ferry ride over from Staten Island. Uh, and if you see that little number there, the zip code 10007, that's where BMCC is. We have two students out of our 25,000 plus that live in that neighborhood. Uh, the reason why <coughs> is by BMCC is in Tribeca, New York City. There's a picture of our brand new building, uh, about three, four years old now, Fitterman Hall. And that's the picture of downtown. You can see World Trade, uh, where we're located uh, in downtown Tribeca. So next is uh, just to show you a little bit of pictures of well, about Tribeca. <coughs> Tribeca, New York City, was ranked number five in the country by Bloomberg's annual rankings of the richest zip codes in the country. So you saw the number that Deb said about almost 90% of our students are on financial aid, and our school's located in one of the, in the fifth richest zip code. There's kind of a conflict of interest there. So that's why a lot of our students are coming in from, out, from the outer boroughs. Uh, again, this is another map of uh, New York City. 
and it's broken down by zip codes. All those little bo strange looking boxes are zip codes. The darker ones are where more of our students are from. The darker the color is the more uh, populated uh, zip codes where our students are from. So you can see areas in, the, in the Brooklyn, up in uh, the Bronx, up top, uh, most of our students. And uh, you know, the students that are from Manhattan are usually up from the uh, uh, Spanish Harlem area and, and the Harlem area. So uh, the next slide shows uh, you know, despite everyone says, oh, your students, you know, you're, you're New York City or your students in New York City, it's easy for them to get there. This is a heat map. Uh, I think it's about two years old, but it hasn't changed very much. Uh, this is how long it takes our students to commute to BMCC. So all of our students are, are on public transportation through our subway system or, and or buses and or ferries. So the darker the color, the longer it takes. Uh, the dark purple, that's over two hours to get to campus. So our students are putting the time and efforts to come to school. Uh, you know, so everything from the, I think, the teal color over to the purple is 50 minutes or more. So our students are spending at least you know, an hour on public transportation getting to campus. And there's a reason why they want to come to our campus. Uh, because we offer over 50 different majors uh, on our campus for students to study. Uh, associate, you have AS degrees, uh, AS, AAS degrees, certificate programs, as well as AA programs. And you know, we're keeping current with the, the trends and needs of, of uh, the workplace uh, environment with our new industries that are developing. In, uh, and we're also scaffolding up uh, programs in our continuing ed program to move into our degree se uh, seeking programs. So, uh, we have a lot of educational option, opportunities for our students. Uh, in addition, again, they come to BMCC for this and also because of the transportation access. We have a, you know, uh, about a dozen different subway lines stop near BMCC. Um, and you know, the reason why the students are coming to BMCC, the primary goal is to graduate. Uh, the next slide will show uh, you know, that they plan to graduate uh, you know, when, they, when we entered, we interviewed the survey the students as they're coming in, uh, they, they do want to graduate. You know, they plan to graduate, 90% plan to graduate from BMCC, and then the others plan to transfer to a four-year school. So they're coming in to get a degree. Um, and you know, because of some of these uh, you know, endeavors that we have, BMCC has been very successful and recognized uh, nationally. We're number three uh, two-year community public institutions for social mobility. Uh, that means students are moving up their economic, and they're, they're changing, the, it's a generational change. They're moving their families from a low uh, economic quartile to the next one. So they're changing their lives. Uh, we're number five, number three for his minority students granting uh, associate's degrees, you know, number three for African American students, number 11 for Hispanic and Asian students across the country. So we're getting them the degrees that they're seeking. Um, other things about the campus is that we're number one, we're the safest campus in New York State, which is fantastic considering that we're in downtown Manhattan. So that has a lot to say about the campus we are, the community we are, uh, and all the staff and security that what we do to make this a, a welcoming and safe place for them to learn. Uh, and then also we're recognized as our, uh, the number one most diverse ethnically and the racially diverse managerial uh, syst ranks in, our, in, the, in the country. That means our uh, upper administration and, and higher uh, leaders on our campus, it's very, uh, very diverse and which represents a lot of our student body. And then because of all that, we've been nominated uh, to uh, participate as a 2021 Aspen Prize Community College uh, Excellence. Uh, award, so we'll be working on that. So moving on to the next, uh, about in local parentis uh, in a higher education. So uh, you know, next is the in local parentis is basically translation means in place of the parent. So a lot of times, you know, the universities have taken the role of the role of the parent uh, when when they send their child uh, to campus. Uh, they assume that the college will be taking care of them, setting the rules and, and disciplining them and providing a, a space for them. Uh, but when you define education there, you know, the Center for Parenting Education website, you know, I think we all know, parents have multiple roles and two of the primary roles is one as being a nurturer and one as providing structure uh, for the student. So those that are, you know, the role as a nurturer, you know, they take care of the basic needs uh, food, care, shelter, uh, clothing, giving love and attention and support. Uh, the role of providing structure, this is 
uh, you know, where they set the boundaries, direction, uh, using discipline, developing who the, 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 the child will become, providing them guidance to grow and change and becoming a, a uh, impactful and positive member of the community. And you know, th that's where the, the students are learning who they are, more, building their moral, moral compass, I sh they should say. So that's the role of the parents is to do that. Um, so throughout history, uh, higher education in local parentheses has been evolving. And primarily, throughout most of its history of higher education, it's, it was more focused and ex the expectation was that it was to set the structure for the students. Uh, specifically, they were charged by, uh, to develop the students the character and moral development, which means uh, they can regulate what students can do outside the classroom, what they can uh, wear, what, who they can associate with, where they can go. Um, and then if they didn't, the university can take action uh, against them as not following the rules. Um, so, you know, the courts didn't interfere with this. They let the colleges do what they do. If you, you know, go back to the classic movie Animal House, you have Dean Wormer who put the students on double secret probation. He didn't have to call their parents. The students didn't have rights to argue. Uh, the colleges just did what they did because they felt it was in the best interest of, of the students to set these regulations. Uh, so some schools, they saw, they had curfews, dress codes, uh, restricting who they can assemble with, how, what they can say, free speech. Um, so some early cases of, of these, uh, the, the, the universities imposing you know, in local parentis, you know, back in 1913, Gott Risperea College. Uh, Gott was a uh, owner of a restaurant that was across the street from Berea College, and the university said to students, you are not allowed to go there. If you go there, we're kicking you out. So he felt it was in his right to sue the college because he's Hurt, they're hurting his business, but the, the, the court said, nope, colleges can set those, those boundaries. Uh, a few years later, Stetson versus Hunt. Hunt was a student. Uh, she may not, you know, nowadays she might have been in, in care of our counseling centers, but she would run around the, the residence halls banging drums and flicking on lights and waking people up at, at strange hours. So they basically told her to leave the college. Um, and the court's ruling was that, well, we, we are assuming that the college is playing the same role uh, as a parent, so, and we wouldn't go into a, a home and dictate to the father on how they would discipline their child. So they, that's how the, the courts went on that one. And the, the last example is Anthony of Syracuse a few years later, and this young lady, uh, Anthony, uh, she was expelled based on rumors that she caused trouble and that she was not a typical Syracuse girl. I don't know what that means, but she was acting out in some way that the university did not uh, felt aligned with their standards and expectations, so they just asked her to leave, and uh, no, they, they told her to leave, they didn't ask her to leave, they told her to leave, uh, and they had no rights. But you know, again, this would change in the 60s. As the, the civil rights movement, uh, students started fighting for their uh, personal constitutional rights, and that created more, some lit litigation with regards to students' rights and universities. Um, and then also, you know, in the early 70s, the 26th Amendment uh, was ratified, which lowered the voting gauge to 18. So the universities became put in this place of, well, how can we, you know, assume this role of, as a parent when the, you know, the students are assuming roles of adults uh, from the country? So they backed off and they said, uh, you know, they weren't held, you know, to be this strict enforcer of rules. They became more of bystanders. And students were responsible for their actions. Um, and whatever happened, happened. So they, students couldn't get hurt, uh, couldn't uh, sue the universities or colleges if they got hurt doing something on their own accord. Uh, a lot of it had to do with uh, alcohol, drugs, uh, risky behavior, and the, the colleges were uh, not you know, held accountable for that. But you know, then as time evolved, their sort of you know, minds came together and they recognized that they are sort of have to be somewhere in the middle, that students have to be responsible for their actions, but the colleges need to help students set those uh, expectations and make, help them make good decisions. So there became a, a close relationship with uh, the, the, the colleges and the students creating these um, you know, expectations of how, how to be a student. And that's when students' rights became, there became judicial boards where students got fair hearings about their, about their decisions. Uh, so in the last 20 or so years, 20, 30 years, there's been more of a shift of a nurturing role um, you know, that's where the, the real strong development uh, of uh, outside the classroom support through student affairs, student development, academic support, 
of um, you know, how to help students you know, dictate on how they were becoming uh, positive members on campus and succeeding, helping them help themselves to succeed. Uh, so there's, there's a, you know, there's a, there became a need to establish a more nurturing and caring role on campus to prevent the student, uh, to, for the more prevalent needs of the students. And more and more research has shown that students are coming to us uh, that, need, that need more assistance. And creating this, these nurturing uh, support services uh, will help you know, support the students to, re, to be retained, persist, and succeed uh, toward their goals of, of graduating. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the research is done, you've probably seen a lot of it, uh, you know, some, through, some through the Hope Center Foundation, uh, but they've seen that students, they're doing, doing research on students and food insecurity, housing insecurity, homelessness, how many hours students are working, uh, their need for financial aid, the emergencies, uh, financial needs, transportation challenges, immigration, mental health. So all these things are, you know, now coming to the forefront of how do we support students. Uh, and research is now backing it up for various foundations and, and institutions uh, of how those combinations uh, you know, work with, help support the student outside the classroom so, so they can succeed. So we're gonna give you a little pop quiz here. Uh, so the quiz is, you know, what do we think is the common goal of college, faculty, administrators, and staff members? Go to work, get a paycheck? That's one, student success, right. Uh, so it's, it's getting the students to succeed. Um, and I think you know, regardless of what role you play on campus, I think that's the ultimate goal. Uh, we're all working toward uh, the student success. We all come at, at it from different angles. You know, student support, student affairs works outside the classroom, faculty work inside the classroom, and the university whole creates an environment uh, that creates a safe space for them to uh, maximize their uh, educational uh, experience. Uh, so research has, has shown that when you connect the students uh, to the campus, getting them involved, creating personal relationships, it has a positive impact on their commitment to college. So when you make these connections, you make them feel a part of it, make them feel that they matter and that they are a part of the campus and they belong, they're gonna stay, they're gonna succeed, they're gonna retain and graduate. Uh, you know, there's been some you know, uh, research out there, some traditional names you may know from student affairs world, uh, Tinto's integration model uh, of you know, the students that when they become academically and socially integrated, they increase their commitment to the institution, which leads to their, their commitment to succeed. Uh, Ku and Pike talk about the involvement outside the classroom uh, has a positive correlation with retention and academics. Austin's uh, theory, that's probably one of the, the, the foundation theories of student development, of uh, students getting involved both inside and outside the classroom uh, enhances their experience. And, and Habley uh, says interactions students have, and this is the part that I like, is uh, interactions with concerned individuals on campus. So that's where we have to come in and make sure that we're putting students and we're putting ourselves out there to work with these students to make them feel that we do care about them, we are working with them, we have their best interest in place, um, and it, that has a direct impact on their success. Uh, so ultimately, this shows that students are more likely to remain enrolled and continue uh, to make academic progress and succeed when they feel that they matter. So that's where us, the faculty, staff, administration have to come in and make sure students feel that they aren't just a number, they aren't just a, a, uh, a, 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 a tuition bill, they're not just a registration number, they matter, their stories matter and where they're coming from. Yeah, and so, Keeping with the, the theory of um, the culture of care, and you know, BMCC, we dedicate much of our time to ensuring that students are provided with the tools that they need to help them to develop in all the ways that they need to succeed. Um, and so the philosophy um, of the culture of care is embedded in our current strategic plan. Um, and so we looked uh, at um, providing the, the services to our students. I mean, we've had a long history of doing, um, the, providing the service to our students um, outside of the, of the academic uh, pursuits. Um, the care is designed to help our students to succeed um, and so uh, to meet their basic needs outside of the classroom. And so understanding the basic needs as it outlined, as is outlined by Maslow's hierarchy of need, we've pushed to really fill the gaps 
that students need to, to have met. Uh, because without helping them to meet those gaps, students are not likely to achieve their academic uh, endeavors. And so when we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which of course is a motivational theory in philosophy, which argues that people aim to meet their basic needs, um, they seek to meet those needs successively. Um, but at the very core of those needs is uh, the very bottom rung of, of, his, um, of his triangle that talks about the various needs that need to be met as humans. Um, is of course uh, food and water, um, shelter, the very, very basic needs that we need to meet. For the purpose of this um, presentation though, we're really going to zero in on food insecurity and we're going to look a little bit at uh, how poverty really impacts our students in relation to food insecurity. So here at BMCC, um, prior to really addressing a lot of the issues that students have brought to us and particularly in implementing our pantry we looked at a number of studies to really get a sense of how um like how, how important how how devastating this uh, issue was this issue of food insecurity was to our students and so we looked at some studies uh, conducted nationally and we discovered that uh, in one study that was conducted in the rural campuses that 59% of the students who uh, were surveyed on those campuses reported that they were food insecure. And food insecurity really, by the mere definition of it, is really those students who have no access to, um, ongoing access to a nutritional sound food. 22% um, of those students were borrowing money to be able to eat on, on a daily basis. Um, and of course, the numbers that were found in those students were higher than the general population in terms of those who were experiencing food insecurity. And then some studies were done with um, urban uh, campuses. Um, and and that, those studies discovered that about 56% of our students, college students, um, experienced some form of food insecurity. And of course, food insecurity or the lack of food and the lack of the basic needs impact students' ability to perform well in school. And so one of the largest studies found that 56% of those identified as having food insecurity also had lower GPA um, averages from school. And, and one can actually you know, surmise the reason for that. If you're hungry, you're actually not able to study um, and focus. Now at CUNY, we've conducted several studies, but the one that we looked at for the purpose of this presentation is the one where a fairly large study was done with about 36,000 students, and 14% of those students were found to be food insecure. 40% um, of those who reported being food insecure were, were uh, household income were about 29,000, less than 30,000 students. So many of our students are living at or below the poverty uh, uh, line. Seventy-one percent of them had an income uh, of less than thirty percent um, in the household. Now, when we looked nationally, we looked at um, the census that came out of uh, of uh, the numbers that came out of the census in relation to poverty, and um, we can make the the correlation between what's going on with our students in relation to food insecurity, and the numbers of people nationally. Who, experience, who are poor, who experience um, the inability really to even afford the basic needs. Um, and so at BMCC, the way that we have um, embraced this issue and, and responded to it is about 10 years or so ago, the single stop office was developed, um, was implemented, and um, that office has really became the corner store cornerstone of providing services and resources to our students um, wherever uh, um, food insecurity or any other barriers were impacting their lives. Because we don't only address the issue of food insecurity, we really look at housing and homelessness. Um, we provide some emergency funds to deal with um, helping our students to pay rent in some instances, um, childcare resources. We have a fairly large uh, immigrant population here, as um, was indicated earlier, and um, to that end, we work with 
working with our students around immigration issues and healthcare through the single staff office. And so this slide gives an indication of all of the wraparound services that we provide to our students. Um, and so we do connect our students with financial counseling, um, with legal counseling, with tax preparation in case we're, in fact, we're getting ready to start our tax program um, next week. Um, government sponsored programs, which of course would be those programs such as healthcare and um, the SNAP benefits, and I'll talk a little bit more in, about that in a moment. Um, and of course, emergency grants. Um, we have a huge referral um, resource to, uh, for students who are seeking housing. Um, and we do provide, uh, on an emergency basis, transportation so our students can get from those out, out of boroughs to us, um, those who, who are in need of that service. Um, the information um, regarding the numbers of students that we have seen since 2010, I mean, this, this, this um, goes through to 2017, and it's a, it's a lot larger now, but at that point, we had provided about 22,000 students um, with services and pulled down about $55 million in, um, in services. Um, and this is with staff that uh, are social workers. We are all licensed social workers in the single staff office, and there's a reason for that. We want to be sure that when students come to us, we can really connect on every level um, with the issues that they are experiencing. Because you can imagine, people are very distraught when they're coming in for services. Um, and so this is a further breakdown of some of the services that we have provided, some of the numbers of students that we've assisted um, through 2017. And so you'll see that in relation to the um, application that applications for SNAP, the food assistance visa we pro that we've submitted, at that time 699 applications were submitted through our office. Um, we had provided um, about um, 2,000, more than 2,000 students, 2,600 students with healthcare insurance, mostly through our, uh, mostly through Medicaid and um, the essential plan. Um, 1,100 students with financial counseling, legal counseling, uh, students, um, 1,100 or more students had received legal counseling, and the dollar figure associated with that is the, um, you know, is, is the number, uh, is the amount of money that it costs to really provide the services to the students um, in terms of the drawdown to the, to the, serve, to the students. Um, at the time, there were uh, 8,000 students who received um, tax, uh, who, who were provided with tax returns, um, the filings, and that number was about $12 million in terms of this, the number of uh, students. And, and most of our students receive a, a return of about $1,400, um, which of course, oftentimes, more often than not, goes into paying household bills because um, the population of our students, the number who receive uh, financial aid, 88%, tells the story about the number who needs the services. And then we have other benefits and other services that we um, would provide to our students. And so I just want to drill down a tiny bit on the supplemental assistance program, the SNAP program, partly because as we speak, it's really being attacked by um, the current administration and it's, uh, it, the numbers are actually going to become even more daunting in terms of who are, who are eligible to receive the services. And I kind of want to zero in on the 41% uh, of the students who are not eligible to even apply for the SNAP program. And the reason this is the case is because there is a work requirement that's associated with um, with applying for SNAP as a student, except that in certain categories, for example, if you have children below a certain age. Um, and so the criteria for even obtaining SNAP becomes very, very difficult um, for them to, to even apply. This 36% that, that says insufficient funds, these are of students who are already receiving SNAP, um, but in some instances, and in most instances, their SNAP benefits do not last throughout the month um, that they receive you know, the, the benefits. Um, in some instances, they may be receiving $16 uh, in, a, in a SNAP benefit. 
Um, and so, you know, it all speaks to the need uh, that we see in our students to, um, to fill in relation to um, helping them to succeed. Um, the past year that we provided tax preparation, we were able to help over 2,000 students and their family members. Um, the service is open to, to students, family members, um, faculty and staff as well, um, because we recognize that many are, are living below the, the um, income guidelines, um, the, the poverty line, in spite of the fact that they're working. And so we open the services to all of those. But these numbers really represent the bulk of the students and their family members who are able to, to obtain the services. And they were able to draw down $3 million last year with an average income of about $1,400 um, to them. Um, last year, we were, we were uh, as a result of all of the um, all of the, the, the studies that we've looked at and um, recognizing the dire need and having students to come to the single stop office throughout the years to express the concerns and, and the needs that they had, we opened um, our food pantry. This is our uh, panther, it's called Panther Pantry. Um, and, uh, you know, we, from, 20, from 18, 2018 to 2019, uh, about 648 students, there's way many more now, but 648 students um, visited our pantry. 689 of them were adults and 81 were children who were living in the home of the adults. Um, four tons of food had been distributed at that point. And just in the spring semester of 2019 alone, we were able to be provided over two tons of food to 150 students. And so we've been seeing an, an increase in the number of students who've been coming to use the pantry um, every 30 days, which is um, how often that they can use the pantry. Now, of course, none of the service that we provide would really be, um, we really be able to, to do unless we were able to plug into uh, what I call our circle of care, internal and external partners. Um, we do receive funding from the Petrie Foundation, uh, from the BMCC Foundation. Um, we do receive some assistance from private partners, uh, United Healthcare, for example. We've been working with them for over 10 years on this campus. Um, we have our federal, uh, our government partnerships with the federal, city, and state partnerships. We've recently, CUNY has recently been uh, granted a million dollar grant for food insecurity specifically that is monitored through the single stop office. We work with the Food Bank for New York in terms of the purchases of the food, um, primarily because it, we get it at a very, very reasonable rate and so we can um, stretch the dollars that we have a lot further. Um, and of course we work with every, every department at BMCC, our internal partners at BMCC, whether it's the faculty, staff, and even in some instances students um, who bring um, other students to, to the um, single staff office or who bring up, or the faculty who call us uh, to ensure that their students who they may recognize as having some issues to come in and receive um, services from us. Um, and recently we developed a partnership with City Harvest who comes in to provide some cooking classes for students, teaching them to cook healthy um, with some of the items from uh, our food pantry. Um, and then they take them on a shopping spree to just give them um, a sense of how to purchase healthy food on the budgets that they are, that they're on. And so, you know, we wanna be sure that we are able to continue to provide these services to our students. And so we've looked at, um, you know, what our sustainability framework would be. Uh, and then of course, much of it requires continuing to seek out additional funders, continuing to work with um, government agencies, whether it's city council or any other agencies. Um, we have some tremendous partnerships with, uh, with city group that, that um, you know, funds our, funds our tax services, for example. Um, so we're going to continue to do some of that. We have recently established uh, our donation um, policy because 
you know, folks, everyone kind of plug into um, wanting to help our students, wanting to be sure that our students are not only healthy to, um, to come to school, but, you know, healthy to, to live healthy lives. Um, and so we've established um, a donation a policy where uh, anyone can actually uh, donate uh, funds, um, monetary, um, make monetary donations or any other donations. We have board members who on their own bring uh, food to the pantry as an example. Um, and we will continue to strengthen our partnerships with our local vendors. We have Whole Foods and Target in our community. Um, we work with Human Resource Administration, HRA, who has recently granted us um, some additional funding that we can use at, as credit through the Food Bank for New York to obtain food for our food pantry. Um, I mean, we, it's, it's a wonderful, actually wonderful thing to be able to get the, um, you know, this, this sort of support. And as a result, uh, we're looking at expanding our pantry and looking at breaking out. Dean may talk a little bit more about that, but we're looking at um, expanding it because, um, you know, the need is there, the students are coming, their families are coming. We provide the service to up to three family members because at this point that's what funding would um, afford us to do. Um, and so, you know, we continue to try to impact the student's success as much as we can. And so, Dean, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, so you can see that there's uh, the results of uh, the single stop office, the impact it has, has had on students. Uh, there's a little chart here that shows uh, students that have used single stop and those that have not. That the first uh, Column talks about students that are first-time students in, in college. So the, one, the ones that went to single stop versus their non-users of single stop, they were able to stay enrolled at almost a 10% higher rate. They pass classes at a higher rate. Their GPAs are higher. And then ultimately, they graduate at a higher rate. And then for even those for students that are, you know, been in school for a couple of semesters that are using the services versus the, their, their peers that are not, again, same thing. They're staying enrolled. They're passing at higher rates. GPAs are better than they're graduating. So this shows uh, that there is an impact through Single Stop. And again, Single Stop was the catalyst to really start galvanizing all the services on campus to create wraparound services to meet our needs of our students. So again, the culture of care using Maslow, you know, you know, we, you know Single Stop uh, seems, you know, focuses primarily on the, the, the lower levels of the basic needs that students have. Because without that, if they're hungry, they, ain't sleep, they aren't sleeping, uh, they don't have a pl safe place to sleep, uh, have shelter. They, again, s school is not a priority for them. It go falls down, it goes from one to two to three to four, depending on uh, what, what their cir circumstances are. But you know, in, uh, at PMCC, we want to focus on all levels of needs. So you know, again, we talked about having students feel that they matter, that they belong. So those are a little bit upper levels of, of Maslow's of self-esteem and belonging. So uh, with, with regard to that, you know, BMCC uh, you know, has incorporated some of the services uh, to support students in different groups. So uh, and this is, like, this is not just BMCC. This is usually traditional at other institutions. A lot of schools have worked with these cohorts of students to really focus them, give them a point of contact, a point person to support them, to listen to them. Uh, a lot of schools have international student offices, veteran services, women's resources, childhood centers. They create peer mentoring programs so students can have uh, peers to talk to. Uh, the counseling centers, tutoring, uh, residence life you know, is a home away from home. Uh, accessibility or disability offices. First year seminars, a lot of schools have these where they basically talk to the students about the transition to college because uh, they come into college, it's a different world, has a different language, has a different expectations than they were in the past, either if they're coming directly from high school or if they've been out of high school for a while and they're coming back from the workforce. It's, universities is, is a different world. Uh, and then also, you know, uh, uh, a lot of schools have diversity centers where people can bring, come together to support each other. <clears throat> and within student affairs, you know, we, we try to create these programs that meet our diverse needs of our students. Uh, we you know, help supplement the, the, the programs to supplement with, with the wraparound services to help minimize and remove obstacles uh, for the holistic need of our students. It helps them get connected to individuals. Again, we have a lot of students, uh, to over 25,000 students, and they, you know, we try to make it a small place by creating these smaller groups. Uh, and it becomes these focused cohorts, these focused programs uh, that work with the students. Uh, so what we do, we identify these students, we put them together, 
Uh, we use the data, again, I talked about it earlier. Uh, we use the data from our uh, systems, you know, either the, the enrollment data, the uh, financial, uh, financial aid data, uh, accessibility data. We put it all together and come out with information to try to create these different cohorts. Uh, and try to create different ways to get them connected and create new opportunities, new touch points for these students. Uh, and it helps us knowing what's, what's going on with our students. We, we look at the data and creating these cohorts. You know, if we make it smaller, they're more willing to talk to us. Uh, they feel safe with those, those people that are working with them. Um, they know who to go to. They have that point of contact. Uh, you know, Deb talked about, you know, she helped students their first semester. They're still seeing her, you know, you know, third and fourth semesters just to say hi or ask her a question, not anything to do with single stop, but they'll go to Ms. Hart and say, where can I go get some information about, you know, this major or advising? And so it's because they made a connection with, with, with uh, Ms. Hart and her team. Um, and again, using the technology, we have all these different softwares that we're bringing in to help make it easier for us to do that. Um, so, but what we do, we call this boutiquing. We make small little shops, you know, a boutique shop, you know, a little small little corner shop, they sell this or that. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create these small little shops where students can go to, have a person to go to, learn about the services and resources. And the goals that we have in developing these uh, boutiques Again, it's building a small community, help them sense that they belong and there's a relationship, that they matter, uh, that they uh, do belong in college. Because you know, sometimes students will take that first test and say, oh my goodness, I'm not ready for college, I don't belong here, there's no one here that looks like me, I have no one to talk to. You know, we want them to move forward that, move that by having these little boutique programs where we're trying to create these little communities for them. Um, you know, it's not just with the staff and faculty, but it's also with other students. And again, that helps create these pathways to services and support that they may not know about. You know, during orientation and when students come in, it's a lot of information for them. We, get, they get, we overwhelm them with all this information and orientation. You know, we, we, read, we read, basically read the whole student handbook and the whole website to them in a couple hours, and we expect them to remember it. They won't remember it. So, you know, if they have that point person, they can go to ask those questions. And, you know, so we have different uh, boutiques that we've created working with students that have stopped out and coming back. Uh, the Dreamer and Undocumented students. We have first generation we call Panther Partners. Uh, Rise students are students that were doing well, but they had a really bad semester, but they're still in good academic standing. But something happened where they went from a 3-2 to a 2-6 in one semester. That's something dramatic. But they wouldn't get caught on any red flags because they're still in good standing. They wouldn't be put on probation. Uh, degree Under Three is a program that we've created to uh, work with students to graduate within three years. So again, these boutiques, lets the students know that we know who they are. We notice when there's a change in their behavior or their academic standings. We help them get connected to personnel. We listen to their stories one student at a time. We have 25,000 students. We have 25,000 different scenarios, different stories, different needs. And we just want to try to customize it as much as possible to work with them. So beyond boutiques within student affairs, we create other ways to connect with students and provide those basic needs that we talked about through Maslow and creating this whole culture of care. Uh, we have a program we call Snacking on Success, SOS Snack Bag. So when they're working with any program, uh, if it's the Veterans Center, if it's Career Development, if it's Counseling, if it's the Vice President, you know, we have bags of granola bars, little water bottles, because again, the numbers that Deb talked about, food insecurity, students are hungry, they don't have the money to pay for food, uh, and again, students are prideful, they're New Yorkers, they can do it on their own. You know, they don't need help from others. But when we can create this safe place where they can talk and share and help us help them, um, you know, it, it leads to their success. Uh, so by being able to have this conversation with them and say, you know, did you eat today? He said, oh, here you go, here's a, here's a little bag to get you on for the day. Uh, we create happy birthday messages. The vice president sends out a birthday message to every single student on their birthday every day. Uh, we provide community service opportunities for students. We have alternative spring breaks. We give them life skill trainings. We, you know, we, we have opportunities for them to learn CPR, first aid. We have swim lessons in our pool for free. Uh, the cooking lessons that Deborah talked about with City Harvest. We don't only teach them how to cook, we teach them how to buy the foods and how to navigate a, shop, a supermarket because they have their own tricks of the trade. They put all the good stuff in the middle and all the stuff you need around the, on the perimeter. Uh, we have happiness expos, good deeds day, Weeks of thanks, we go around and thank students for being students. Uh, we give them candy you know, during Thanksgiving and say thank you for being a student. Uh, we, work, we reach out to students that have incomplete grades. So these are some of the things that we've done in student affairs. An example of uh, the birthday message there, there's one student that got it and you know, she was worried about her test and on her birthday and you know, she wrote an email back to the vice president saying thank you, you're the only one who gave me a birthday wish and you know, I don't have any family here. 
Uh, so it's nice to get that feedback. Some of them can send an email back saying, oh, thank you, for Autobot, for sending me a birthday message. The vice president will write back and say, well, this is your vice president. I hope you're beautiful, enjoying this beautiful sunny day on a Tuesday. So they write back, oh, wow, you're real. So, uh, so you know, we're using technology to do that. You know, that's another way that we're using it to advantage it. The next is a picture of us going around on the week of thanks where we, again, went around, gave out Jolly Ranchers and Starbursts because we want students to be jolly and happy. We want them to tell them their stars. And this was during Thanksgiving. And we went around, and administrators and faculty were just giving out candy. Students were like, wait, I don't take candy from strangers. Why are you giving me candy? <laughs> and we just told them, you know, we're just happy that you're here. And let you us know if you need any help. And we also gave students to give an opportunity to write back to our uh, faculty and staff that they want to say thanks to. You know, a faculty member who helped them, an advisor who helped them, a public safety officer who helped them find their wallet. So the students wrote uh, over like 300 messages to different people on campus and we delivered it to them. Um, so beyond student affairs, you know, like I said, you know, I'm from student affairs, Deb is in student affairs, that's what we focused on, but the, it's a culture of care throughout the whole campus community. Uh, so some of the uh, initiatives that we're doing outside uh, to make sure that we're creating this environment where students feel safe, they feel that they matter, that their success is our priority. Uh, we've we're using Starfish retention software to connect faculty, to advisors, to students, to make sure our students are doing well. We've created academic cohort programs, learning communities. You know, I'm sure a lot of schools here have some sort of uh, approach to that where they have small, uh, the advisors have small cohorts of students they work with and they connect with. Uh, we've included all the support services, not all of them, some of them, the priority ones, uh, on the syllabus and in Blackboard. Uh, right now, all the syllabus on campus, all the syllabi, have a page that indicates where they can go for Title IX, sexual harassment issues, single stop services, and counseling services. And because of that, uh, traffic to single stop and, and counseling and Title IX concerns have increased. Um, uh, open educational resources. Our faculty took initiative to try to eliminate textbooks because textbooks cost a lot of money and our students can't afford it. So uh, we've had, you know, last year we had over 500 sections that had no textbooks. And we actually have an entire degree, criminal justice, you can earn without buying a single book unless you want to. Uh, but they, they're not required. Uh, we work with uh, you know, creating gender neutral bathrooms, uh, having students that want to have gender name changes on their uh, in the registrars in their system. So when a faculty sees their uh, roster, if they choose to go by a name that's not their official name, the student can tell it and make those changes so the faculty will call them by the proper name. We have programs that work with uh, students that are on public assistance, uh, students that were justice involved, coming back into the uh, school. Second chance students are students that failed out of other schools and are coming back to us. So these are programs that we were trying to create you know, in a place where students feel that they matter and they can, they can succeed. And you know, obviously with the single stop office, again, part of the, the core of the uh, providing rapid ride services. And also human resources, you know, they're doing workshops on uh, sensitivity training and awareness training. Uh, we've developed, we developed an equity and inclusion task force uh, for the campus for faculty and staff to how do we address these issues. So it's not just an idea out of the president's office or student affairs, it's everywhere. And like Deborah said, it's part of our uh, strategic plan. And faculty play a big role. You know, we, uh, they, they see every student every day, three or four times a week. People, students come to our offices if they are brought to our office, you know, recommended to our office, or they are invited or choose. We don't see every student, but faculty do. So they, they have to be on board in providing this information to, uh, and have a safe space for them to talk about what their needs are and where to go when they need them. Um, so like I said, we have 25,000 students with a wide array of needs. Some students have a different combination of needs, but we have to sit and listen to them. Uh, and by building these, this embedding a culture of care throughout all aspects of the college campus, build these small cohorts, uh, we're helping make changes in our retention and persistence. Uh, you know, over the last five years, our graduation rate has uh, increased 50%, uh, and it's our current, we are our current high, we, our last graduating class was the highest graduating class we've had. Uh, we're f redefining uh, in local parentis, not just to mean setting the rules and the structure, but it's creating this nurturing and caring environment. Because uh, we're complementing what's happening at home. You know, like I said, a lot of them are first generation students. They don't understand the college environment, the culture. So by working with the families, coming to parent orientation, working with the services Single Stop provides, we're creating this place where students get, are getting the basic needs. They feel safe. They can develop a sense of belonging, strengthen their self-confidence, self-esteem that they belong, 
and so they can give back and, and, and become successful and productive students. Um, and you know, creating these touch points and opportunities you know, for each student to have their needs met creates a sense that they belong and that someone at BMCC cares for them, that they, are, they do matter. And because we care, because we notice them, they come to our programs, they come to our services, and they get what they need because we're creating that environment. Uh, and this approach succeeds due to the dedication. You know, without the staff, the faculty saying, yes, we're all in, we care about our students, this wouldn't work. So it's really important that you know, it's an all-inclusive conversation. Uh, we've actually been invited to participate in the National Caring Campus Initiative through the Institute of Evidence-Based Change. So we'll, we'll be starting that this semester. Um, so as a result, you know, of these successes, BMCC has been able to take this message out to the community, like Deb mentioned, and partner with others, partnership with foundations, corporations, agencies, uh, to talk about what we're doing, to augment our services, to help provide services to our students that we can't all do on our campus, providing funding to, to give to our students to help out. And they help champion our message and to create a, a caring and supportive environment for, for our students. And ultimately, uh, it creates, you know, it's not just us at BMCC. It takes the whole village of lower Manhattan and New York City to help our students succeed. Uh, so, you know, creating this culture of care is imperative. You know, again, we use the technology to our abilities. Again, technology is a fantastic tool, but if you don't have the players that know how to use the instruments, you won't be able to make great music, as I say, uh, before. So, you know, the, the, the technology is there, but if you don't know how to use it, uh, it, it, it inhibits the success. So you make sure your staff and faculty are maximizing the use of, of the technology for that. So, And I think that's it. We're close to our time. Uh, Deb, how are you doing there in New York? I'm doing really great. Um, thank you for the uh, opportunity. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions? I think we have one coming up. Uh, Deb, I might have to repeat it if you don't hear it. Let me know if you can't hear it. Okay, Hi, good great. morning. Uh, you spoke about counseling services. I'm curious if you can drill down a little bit and talk about uh, any mental health support and or life coaching programs great. that you have. Yeah, with, with regard to the counseling, the question was about you know, the counseling center support. Yeah, I heard him. Okay, great. Uh, our, our counseling center is, uh, you know, we all have, we have licensed uh, counselors, social workers, uh, psychologists on, on campus. Uh, it's really short-term care. And we have a relationship with uh, uh, a local hospital, mental, facility, mental health facility, so we'll refer them out for that. Um, but you know, because of the the awareness that's happening, they're getting more traffic. You know, there's more information to the students uh, through orientations, through the faculty, through the syllabi, uh, that we have these services, and the faculty and staff know about it, so they're bringing students there. So as as the the, the students are coming in to talk about, you know, maybe surface issues like academic success the counselors are drilling down to finding out why they're not succeeding, why they're uh, having trouble. And a lot of it is anxiety, depression, relationship issues. Uh, you know, for severe cases, we do um, you know, refer it out. We have, uh, again, like I said, a relationship with Long Island uh, Hospital where, where we have our students transported there. It's, a, it's, a, it's an intake facility where students would be able to stay. Uh, you know, the health in, uh, insurance co is covered, the coverage the, the services are covered by health insurance. Uh, that's part of the partnership we have. So we are able to take them out there uh, if they need more severe intervention with regard to their issues uh, that, they're, that they're facing, so. How would you see these services being provided for online students? Online students, that's our next challenge. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, we're, we'll be working with our, because yeah, a lot of the services are on, on site, so we're doing face-to-face -face with our students. The next step is to provide these uh, services and outreach uh, to the online students. You know, we're starting to develop the, the uh, our online freshman experience is going to be online, so the online students will be able to go through it on their own, at least to be aware of the resources. Uh, a lot of our online students are local, uh, so they are. But again, they're working. Uh, you know, they're taking class. You know, when they get home, they have the late shift and whatever. They take the class when they can. Uh, we, have a, we have a very large weekend and uh, evening population, so those services are a little scaled back for them as well. So, but you know, a lot of our offices are open later. You know, some of, we have at least one night a week. We're open until seven, six, seven o'clock. Uh, most of them are open until six o'clock anyway. But you know, we'll have a night where they go to six o'clock. We have weekends uh, for various offices as well. So we try to do that outreach. But again, it's trying to get to the next level. It's like, how do you do online, you know, uh, online counseling? We have online tutoring right now to assist the students that they can research. The, the library resources are all, you know, uh, 24 hours librarian. 
Uh, so we're moving that, but the care part is the hard part uh, to get them in because you know it, they barely have time to take the classes and for them uh, to you know, take advantage of it. Is it Deb, I don't know if we have, we, 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 I guess, we don't well, real, not, not really show about the to, services uh, we're providing for our, oh, go ahead, those that we can, can, you hear, can they hear me? Go ahead. Um, yeah, I was just going to chime in, chime in and say that in relation to the students who contact us for taking online classes, we will make special arrangements for them to come in, those who want to use the pantry as an example, um, and as much information that we can share um, that we don't need to see them face to face, uh, we absolutely make those arrangements as well. Um, but it is a challenge um, for evening, weekend, and, and online um, students who take online courses. Um, and but you know it's something that we're continuing to to examine um, to try to figure out exactly how we can also provide the same level of services to them. Okay. And hopefully we'll figure it out and come back in 2022 and present it. <laughs> <laughs> So I think we have about a minute before we have to switch over for our next presentation. So if there are any, any other questions? Yes, one more. Uh, uh, since the program, uh, single stop program, do you guys have uh, data regarding the alumni involvement with, the, with this program or how is it uh, after they graduate, their involvement back to the university uh, community. Right. Well, let, then let me start real quickly. A lot of our students, they do move on to a four-year school, so they're continuing their education. So uh, they'll move on to most likely the other schools in CUNY, and they usually come back and are upset because they're not getting the same great services that we provided them at BMCC at the four-year schools because it was really initiated for community college students. But Deb's had plenty right. of students come back asking for assistance. Right, and, and so um, we do we do encourage our alumni students to come back and um, and utilize the tax prep services as an example. Um, many of them, in fact, will will come back and work on the campus. Um, and if there are services that we can offer, um, mostly outside of the emergency funds, we really do make all of the wraparound services that we have available. Uh, to our alumni or to our um, and to of course our existing students, um, so we try our best to to also bring them into the circle of care because um, you know they're part of our family. Uh, so as much as possible, we we um, extend our services to them as well. Okay. Anything else? Well, we, okay, well, we all we thank you for your your attention. I know we give you a lot of information in a short amount of time. Uh, and we wish we had more time because we can probably, I know we can talk long about all these services that we're doing. But hopefully it was a little glimpse on what we're doing at BMCC. Obviously the idea is to take some of these nuggets that we've given you and to you know, adjust it for your needs on your campus for your students. And hopefully uh, if you, you know, have any questions, feel free to contact me or Deborah. We'll you know, give you some more suggestions or ideas that we've been working on. So again, thank you for your time and your questions. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Deb. Bye from New York. Stay warm. It's, it's supposed to snow tonight in New York City, so.